Welcome to another general psychology mini lecture with Ian McFarlane. Uh, we're covering human development this week, and the topic of this mini lecture is going to be parenting. So, as we discussed in class, one of the biggest uh, questions in human development is nature versus nurture. Okay, what comes uh, as some kind of biological imperative, and what is more driven by the way that we're socialized and raised? Uh, and as we talked about in class, that's really a false dichotomy because both uh, influence each other. But one of the major socialization and nurture components is parenting and the way our parents raise us. Um, so we're going to explore uh, the different ways that uh, parents approach uh, their roles as parents and some of the outcomes that these different parenting styles are associated with, as well as cultural differences in parenting. So one of the big names in parenting is a psychologist named Diana Baumrind. Uh, Diana Baumrind uh, is uh, famous in, in the parenting literature because she's the one who developed uh, these classifications of parenting styles. So you'll hear a lot about these different parenting styles. Uh, there's been a ton of research on how these different styles have uh, influenced children uh, over the lifespan. Um, and she put her theory together based on two different axes. So there's two factors uh, that really influence uh, parental style. So the first uh, factor in terms of parenting style is uh, how demanding or controlling are the parents. So some parents will be high demand, um, will have lots of specific requirements for their kids, will be, um, have, be very involved in working with their children, Whereas other parents are going to be less demanding. Uh, they're not going to take more of a hands-off role. Uh, they're not going to be as uh, kind of micromanaging or, or looking over their kid's shoulder. Um, they're going to let the kids uh, kind of develop more on their own in a more kind of independent uh, fashion. The other factor uh, in Baumrind's model is the uh, degree of acceptance or warmth um, in, the, in the parents. So uh, parents can either be very accepting and responsive, meaning that they um, give a lot of positive messages, that they, uh, when the child uh, wants interactions or needs attention, they're quick to respond, um, or some other parents uh, are much less accepting and demand that kids uh, change kind of who they are in order to be um, what the parents want them to be. Um, uh, they may not be as responsive uh, to the demands or the, the needs of the child um, or as emotionally available. So with these two different factors, you can see that there's four possible parenting styles. So we'll talk about each one uh, briefly. So parents who are high in demand or control, uh, another way you might think about this is strict parents, um, but they're also high on the accepting and responsive domain, um, we call those parents authoritative. Authoritative parenting is a blend of having really high standards and um, you know, setting, setting the bar high for, for your kids in terms of behavior and goals and achievement. Um, while similarly being um, very warm and accepting uh, and encouraging along the way. Parents who are high in the demand and control domain, but high in the rejecting or non-responsive uh, domain, those are called authoritarian parents. So these parents tend to be um, kind of the, the stereotypical overly strict parents. Uh, these are the my way or the highway kind of parents. Uh, these are parents who are more likely to uh, scream and yell in order to get what they want. Uh, in comparison with the authoritative parents are more likely to uh, explain the reasons why they have the standards that they do, why they have the rules that they do, um, in a way to help the child understand why it's important to behave a certain way. So you can almost think of authoritarian parenting uh, as similar to um, kind of dictatorships where the parents are in control of the house and the children um, just need to do what their parents say, kind of just because their parents say it. 
Um, when parents are high on the non-demanding or lenient domain, but also high on the accepting or responsive domain, uh, that's called permissive parenting. So permissive parenting uh, is kind of, you may also hear it referred to as hands-off or laissez-faire parenting. Uh, these are parents who um, want children to discover their own way in the world. Uh, they want kids to be able to uh, follow their own instincts, to be able to follow um, what, they, what their interests are, and they don't set up a lot of structure um, in, in the home. So um, when there's conflict, parents are more likely to um, take a step back, uh, to let the kids make their own mistakes, uh, and, to, um, and to have to figure things out on their own. Now, when parents are not demanding, are overly lenient, not very strict, um, but they're also not very warm and accepting, uh, we call that parenting style uninvolved. Uh, so this is, um, parents are essentially um, kind of roommates with the, with the kids. Uh, it may be uninvolved in terms of not actually being physically present. So while the permissive style is there's, the parents are still attentive and involved in the um, in an uninvolved, the the parents really um, don't pay much attention to the child. Um, they may provide the kind of basic uh, legal requirements in terms of food, water, and shelter, and those kind of things, um, but they're not going to take a particular interest uh, in their children. They've done a lot of research on families and classified the parents into one of these four parenting styles, and then they follow the kids to determine kind of what impact these parenting styles have on them as they grow up. Uh, the authoritative parenting style consistently produces the best results in terms of kids who are more successful in school, kids who have uh, fewer behavior problems, f kids who have fewer um, me mental health and uh, physical health issues. Uh, Authoritative parenting tends to come out on top. Uh, the parenting style that tends to produce the, the most kind of problems is the uninvolved uh, parenting style. You tend to see a lot more behavior issues, uh, a lot lower educational achievement, uh, difficulty in socializing. You tend to see a lot more problems across a lot more domains. Now remember that these are trends in parenting styles. So just because um, one particular set of parents is permissive or authoritarian or authoritative, we don't necessarily know how that's going to affect the kid moving forward. Um, so while on average authoritative parenting tends to produce the best outcomes, just because uh, if you chose to be an authoritative parent, it doesn't guarantee that your child will have lots of academic success and a uh, few behavior problems and things like that. Similarly, just because uh, a, a particular child has uninvolved parents doesn't doom them to um, a life of uh, lower achievement. But generally, if you want to play the odds, the best bet is to take an authoritative approach to parenting. Now, another variable that plays a big role here is culture. So there are lots of cultural differences in terms of how, and as we've done uh, better research that involves uh, more diverse samples of participants, uh, we've learned a lot about different cultural impacts on parenting and child development. So for example, um, as we've studied authoritative parenting across a broader cross-section of parents, we found that the benefits of authoritative parenting tend to transcend most demographic categories. Uh, so authoritative parenting tends to provide really good outcomes regardless of racial differences, regardless of socioeconomic status. Uh, socioeconomic status is a proxy for uh, kind of economic uh, prosperity, so uh, kind of roughly uh, equated to kind of class in terms of working class or middle class or upper class. Um, socioeconomic status or SES is how we tend to talk about that in psychology research. Now, interestingly, we've um, as we've done more research on authoritarian parenting, um, we've come to a, a better understanding of the role of culture. So. A lot of the early research on authoritarian parenting um, found that uh, minority parents, in terms of racial minority parents, uh, tended to use authoritarian parenting much more frequently than uh, white parents. 
And so this was uh, originally used as kind of a weapon and to discredit um, minority groups in terms of their ability to parent. As they did more research, however, what they found um, was that the the outcomes for uh, authoritarian parenting were much less negative than they were uh, for the, the white parents. So while the minority parents may be more likely to use authoritarian parenting, uh, and while the authoritative parenting uh, tended to produce the best outcomes still, uh, regardless of racial group, the the kind of the change in outcome was far less negative uh, for authoritarian uh, among minority parents than it was for white parents. Now, there's a number of reasons uh, why this might be the case. Uh, one has to do with uh, the the way that parents were classified. Uh, so, a lot of the um, the classifications were done by having uh, research assistants uh, who tended to be white uh, middle class individuals going into homes and kind of watching parents interacting with their kids. So during these observations, uh, the, the research assistants tended to notice uh, a lot of yelling and raised voices uh, among my minority parents. Uh, and tended to classify them as being more authoritarian, so being lower in terms of warmth and acceptance. Um, when we talk about emotion later this semester, we'll talk about uh, cultural differences in the expression of emotion. And so the raised voices and yelling in some uh, cultural groups is not associated with kind of the anger or hostility that it tends to be associated with among kind of majority European American culture. Uh, for example, in some cultures, if you're not uh, raising your voice, that indicates that you're not really passionate or you don't really care particularly about the, the topic of conversation. So neither the kids nor the parents were experiencing the yelling as uh, harsh or rejecting, so the classification as authoritarian may not have been appropriate in the first place. Uh, you also have the um, overlay of socioeconomic status in that a lot of these minority parents were coming from uh, neighborhoods where there was uh, significantly more just physical uh, danger in terms of violence uh, in the neighborhood. And so having stricter rules uh, that weren't questioned or weren't pushed uh, in terms of curfews, in terms of coming right home after school, um, tended to be more protective and facilitative uh, than they were in neighborhoods where than they were in neighborhoods where where that wasn't the case. So parallel to what we talked about in early attachment research, the early research in parenting styles was done almost exclusively with mothers. Um, they have replicated the um, these studies with fathers now, and they found that the the same uh, relationships hold. So regardless of the gender of the parents, um, the uh, parenting styles tend to produce similar outcomes. Uh, similarly, they have done uh, research on LGBT parents and found, uh, again, very similar outcomes to uh, heterosexual parents. There's no indication that children raised by LGBT parents uh, have any kind of negative uh, consequences uh, for that. One intersection of parenting and culture that's got a lot of attention in the media over the last 10 years or so is the phenomenon of tiger parenting. Tiger parenting um, refers to a uh, style of parenting um, by Asian uh, parents, in particular Chinese mothers, uh, and the term tiger parenting came uh, to the forefront because of a book written by uh, Amy Chua uh, that came out called Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mom. The book describes the parenting methods and uh, principles she used to raise her two high-achieving daughters. She criticizes the uh, way that Americans tend to parent uh, and says that the, the traditional Chinese way of uh, raising children um, is was far superior and when she implemented that with her kids she saw them take off uh, and become much more high achieving than their peers. So in her book Chua talks about setting extremely high standards for her children, about not accepting anything less than first place or perfection. She talks about uh, making her children practice. Uh, for example, one of her daughters plays the violin and she forces her to practice for hours a day. 
uh, how they demand uh, respect and obedience from their children, um, and they they don't praise uh, based on effort. The book was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it was kind of everywhere in the media for a while. Um, as uh, lots of parents from a variety of different cultural backgrounds uh, tried to decide if they needed to adopt some of these uh, models of tiger parenting. So tiger parenting, if you think about it in terms of Baumrin's uh, classification, would be an extreme form of author the authoritarian parent. Tiger parents are very much concerned with the following of rules uh, and not particularly concerned with the kind of warmth uh, and acceptance that the children feel. Uh, for example, in the book, Chua talks about um, rejecting a uh, birthday card that her daughter made for her when her daughter was five because the daughter didn't spend enough time and energy uh, on the card. So what does the research say about tiger parenting? The research is, is fairly mixed in terms of what tiger parenting does uh, for children. Um, there is some research support for the principles that Chua lays out. Um, for example, there's some um, research that shows that uh, praising ability as opposed to praising effort can lead to um, higher levels of achievement. Um, it helps kids to identify areas in which they are, have strengths uh, and teaches them that just trying hard isn't good enough. Although there is other research that shows that um, being in part of a growth mindset, so a lot of Carol Dweck's work on mindset, um, shows that um, if you are reinforcing the amount of effort people are putting in as opposed to the um, final outcome, you get kids that are more resilient in the face of failure, kids who are able to better deal with uh, negative outcomes because they aren't uh, so consumed with kind of this perfectionism. Tiger parenting also puts a high amount of, of stress and energy on practice, uh, whether that's practice for a musical instrument like uh, Chua talks about with her daughter, whether that's uh, practicing athletics, practicing uh, academic pursuits, doing practice problems, things like that. Um, there's a lot of evidence that uh, practicing significantly does help improve performance. Uh, although it does matter uh, kind of how you're practicing uh, and uh, things like that as well. But there's a number of uh, research studies that have also found um, negative associations with tiger parenting. Uh, for example, there have been a number of studies that have found actually lower academic achievement um, in terms of lower GPA and lower um, performance on standardized tests for children um, of tiger parents. There's also been uh, associations with um, decreased social functioning, uh, lower overall psychological health, and a lower sense of family obligation, which essentially is a measure of kind of how connected uh, to your family do you feel, um, how much uh, do you feel like you're a part of your family, things like that. Uh, along with this, there's been uh, research that's shown that kids uh, of tiger parents tend to feel much higher academic pressure. They tend to feel alienated in terms of made, made to feel like they don't connect with either their family or with their peers because they don't get a chance to do as much socialization. And there's been um, an in presence of uh, more frequent depressive symptoms. Now, an interesting study was also done that looked at parenting styles in China. Um, since Chua was talking about using Chinese uh, principles in raising children, um, they did a, a study in China to actually see how prevalent this tiger mom phenomenon was there. And what they found was mothers in China actually showed a lot more psychological flexibility and willingness to compromise with their children than Chua was talking about in, in her book, uh, leading some people to believe this was more of a generational um, issue rather than necessarily a uh, cultural difference. Um, so it, it, the, the role of parenting and the role of parents in China uh, is shifting and evolving. So there's a lot more going on here than just a simple cultural difference. And some people have um, connected this idea of tiger parenting and cultural differences with the research on parental involvement. So parental involvement is the degree to which uh, parents are um, connected uh, with their children, the degree to which they uh, understand what's going on with their children. You hear about parental involvement a lot in terms of our parents, do parents show up to um, 
games and concerts and uh, events in in their children's lives? Do they spend time reading with them, uh, helping them with their homework, things like that? Uh, and generally, parental involvement uh, has been found to facilitate really healthy development. So as parents are involved with their kids, uh, there tend to be a lot better outcomes in terms of lots of different domains. Uh, there's research that shows that kids who have involved parents do better academically. They tend to have fewer um, emotional issues or mental health problems. They tend to have more positive social relationships um, with peers. They tend to have uh, fewer behavior problems at school or at home. And they tend to engage in more pro-social behaviors. So pro-social behaviors are things like helping others out, uh, sharing, uh, donating to charity, uh, pro-social behaviors, anything that you are doing something nice for somebody else. Uh, and they tend to have uh, higher levels of hope and optimism as well. So if parents look at this research, they may decide they need to get more and more involved in their child's life. Um, and that's great, although there comes a point where parental involvement can become too much. So when parents are over-involved, um, they sometimes get referred to as what's called helicopter parents. So they're helicopter parents because they hover uh, over their children uh, and never really let their children strike out and um, develop on their own. So while these parents are well-meaning, um, the the kind of over-involvement, the, the lack of letting or by not letting children make any of their own mistakes, by jumping in to try to fix problems for them, uh, they can sometimes end up creating uh, more problems than they're solving. Uh, for example, uh, research on parents who uh, are over-involved in, with their kids um, shows that kids uh, from these parents generally have uh, lower levels of maturity uh, and ability to cope with their emotions. Uh, they tend to really struggle, especially in the face of failure. Uh, if they make mistakes or something doesn't go how they want, they have very low frustration tolerance uh, and ability to problem solve. They tend to have uh, lower motivation towards school and they tend to uh, have more behavior problems at, while at school. Uh, kids are f from over-involved parents tend to have higher um, usage of psychiatric medication, uh, and they're more likely to abuse pain medications. These are you know, over, uh, prescription medications that are um, abused, things like Oxycontin, um, uh, opiates, things like that. Uh, and children uh, from over-involved parents tend to report higher levels of entitlement uh, and have uh, more difficulty in communicating with others. You know, individual results may vary. So you, you or people you know may have had over-involved parents or tiger parents, uh, and you may have turned out really well. Um, but again, on average, what we're finding is that children do need a certain degree of responsibility for their own actions and ability to become um, kind of creators of, of their path. Um, but the overall message uh, in terms of parental involvement is it's really more about the quality instead of the quantity of, of involvement. So even parents who aren't able to be at every um, soccer game or at every ballet uh, performance or piano recital, um, that might be okay as long as um, they're compensating, as long as they ha are having meaningful and quality interactions with their kids in, in other domains. Um, it's important that we understand that um, it's, it's more about how the kids feel and how the kids are able to process their relationship with their parent as opposed to just the sheer amount of time and energy that's put in. Okay, one last topic I want to cover uh, is related to uh, cultural differences in attachment. So we talked about attachment styles in class uh, and we have talked about uh, the kind of rates at which you find these different attachment styles uh, in uh, U.S. culture. But as we look at different places in the world, uh, we find that there are differences in the kind of the baseline attachment uh, styles. 
Um, so, for example, in, in Africa, across a number of African cultures, um, they find that they don't really have avoidantly attached kids, um, but they find much higher rates of disorganized attachment. Now, if you remember from our attachment conversation, um, disorganized attachment um, is tends to be associated with very inconsistent parenting or tends to be sometimes associated with things like child abuse or neglect. So when these findings first came out, there was a lot of um, negative interpretation of the parenting skills of African parents. As they dug deeper into this, um, what they found, though, is it's really about the, the test that's used. Now, Ainsworth's strange situation test was used with, with children in Africa uh, and found to be um, reliable. Depending on where you are in Africa, there's uh, wildly different parenting uh, practices. So in many African cultures, uh, the, the child spends most of the day um, physically attached to the parent, um, being carried around during daily tasks. Uh, it's very rare for a child not to be um, with the mother. So the uh, strange situation test where the mother leaves the child alone is so foreign and disorienting to the, the kid um, that there's, it's really not, um, you're not testing the same things as you are uh, with kids in other cultures. So kids don't know how to respond and it can be somewhat traumatic for kids uh, to be in those situations. Now, interestingly, in Germany, when they do these studies, there's a big difference even in uh, northern versus southern Germany. In southern Germany, um, the rates of the different attachment styles is very similar to the US. But in northern Germany, um, half of kids, about 50%, end up being classified as avoidantly attached. And again, some people looked at these initial findings and they decided that um, it meant that Germans were poor parents um, because they weren't producing securely attached children. Um, what it actually comes back to is there's a practice in northern Germany that really encourages uh, even really young kids to be very independent. Um, so kids are, are often um, encouraged to play on their own um, without uh, a parent nearby, uh, even at the age of one. So the test, again, doesn't, isn't really testing um, what we think it is because the child is used to um, being without mom and doesn't necessarily need mom as that source of, of comfort. Uh, in Chinese samples, they tend to find very similar results to the U.S. So even though Chua um, talked about the, the difference in Chinese parenting, uh, it looks like there is not a difference, at least in terms of the, the kids uh, and how they're attached with their parents. Uh, in Israel, uh, they've found that they have fewer avoidant uh, children than the U.S., but they tend to have more of the uh, ambivalent children, um, although it's not clear at this point exactly what's going on there. In the Chilean samples, uh, they found much higher rates of disorganized uh, attachment than the U.S. samples, but further research has revealed this has a lot more to do with socioeconomic status. There's far more people living in much more extreme levels of poverty uh, than in the U.S. So again, it's much more about socioeconomic status, status and access to resources uh, than it is um, anything about uh, parenting styles per se. So that wraps up our conversation of parenting styles as well as um, the different ways that parents approach their roles across a variety of cultures. If you have any questions about the content of the mini lecture, um, please send me an email or come by office hours and we'll get your questions answered. See you next time.